you haven't met, my name is Alex. I am the youth pastor here, and it is the Sunday before Christmas Eve. Y'all, we want week away. Who still hasn't Christmas shopped yet? Let's be honest. Come on, my people. Come on, people. Let's go. I am so excited and honored that my pastors would allow me to be up here to search God and say to God, my God, what do you want me to preach to his church? So I honor my pastors. Thank you for letting me be up here. And guys, I am excited about today. Um, like I said, I am the youth pastor. Um, I've been here for now eight years. And um, right now, we've been in this series looking at the little details of the Christmas story. There's things that seem insignificant. If you remember week one, uh, Pastor Andy talked about the shepherds and how when we have good news, we've got to share it with people. And the best news of all is that Jesus would save us. That is the absolute, I mean, he made us laugh, he made us cry, he gave us Jesus. And then last week, Pastor Connie talked about how we should be like Mary when it comes to our relationship with God. And she said a line that was so good. It was that culture brings confusion, but God's word brings clarity. And I was like, man, not only do the students that I lead on Wednesdays need to hear that, but I need to hear that. And they started this tradition. Uh, they've each done it, and I can't be the pastor that breaks the tradition. They each read the Christmas story. They, they cued some music. Yeah. They cued some music. They turned on the fireplace. Oh, there it is. It, it's like a freedom Christian tradition, y'all. This is, this is like my new favorite tradition, alongside watching Die Hard, which is a Christmas movie. It, it is. And those that say it's not, Home Alone and Die Hard are the same movie One's for kids, one's for adults. That's all I'm gonna say. Same movie. All right, so you're all distracting me. Let's get to it. All right. This is Luke chapter two. And at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Cornelius was governor over Syria and all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged and was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. And that night there were shepherds staying nearby in the fields, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, said, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped. Someone say wrapped. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, I need you in this place. Lord, we need your word to penetrate our heart, our souls, our minds, and every area of our lives. God, I thank you that we get to gather today. We get to worship you. We get to hear your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Ask your neighbor the title of my sermon, What Are You Wrapped In? <laughs> Who actually likes wrapping gifts? Just curious. Okay, I'm gonna send my gifts to y'all. Y'all can wrap them for me because I, I don't enjoy I, And I'm, so like I said, I am the youth pastor here, so I thought I would bring like a youth game. And so I'm gonna have my two students come up, Addison and Cohen, you're, y'all come on up. Bring out the supplies out. Yep, there it is. Y'all come on up. And so here, here's a, I'm gonna transport y'all to youth. On Wednesday nights, we'll have like a countdown. Why don't y'all stand right here? Here, you're, you're gonna be the rapper, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Cohen, we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna give you all 30 seconds. I'm gonna have you stand right here. Uh, you gotta wrap Cohen in 30 seconds. Put the clock on. We're gonna transport y'all to youth. It's a Wednesday night. Let's get hyped. 30 seconds. Go, put it, put the hat down. All right, come on, Ashley. You gotta move quicklier than that. I can feel the fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do the hat down. Let's go. That's the tricky side, but they let the big side off. Oh, I'm probably trying to get me. You gotta get the feet too. You gotta go lower. You gotta go lower. Turn it down, cause the boy's fine. If you notice, they're in our PJs.
Yeah, I give it to him. Uh, I would say that's good enough. Y'all go, y'all can head to the stage. Y'all take the supplies with you if you don't mind. Y'all want to get that head on. Y'all give them a hand. Give them a hand. <laughs> we we have some fun. I said, and by the way, I I love Freedom Muth. We're we like, can I just celebrate with y'all? There were eleven students on Wednesday that said yes to Jesus here. We had 299 students, 41 leaders. Come on, somebody. Think about that. If you serve in Freedom Kids or Freedom Youth and you serve the next generation, I just want to say thank you. Like, and could you imagine? Yeah, give them a hand. Come on, y'all. Like, it's incredible. It really is. 299 students. Could you imagine if it was just me? They would take over. It would be a coup. They would win. I'd be like, y'all win. Anyways, that, that was like, what I, if you haven't caught the little detail yet, the thing that I want to talk about in the story is that Jesus was wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. Verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. So my wife is a NICU nurse and knows how to swaddle a baby. I have no idea how to do that. But I'm sure Mary wrapped him better than Addison wrapped Cohen up there. I'm sure she did a great job. But you might be th thinking to yourself, why is this detail important? Well, to get to the why this detail is important, we need to understand that this story of Jesus' birth is important because not only was he born, but he lived. He lived a perfect life. And not only did he live and live a perfect life, but he died. And, and that he died and didn't stay dead because three days later he rose again as king of kings and lord of lords. So it's important to know that that's part of this story. And uh, when Luke is writing this good news, the gospel of Luke, if you don't know, gospel means good news. He's writing it as an author. I mean, he's, he's portraying this story. And like all great authors... They like have themes all throughout the book. Like, like there's, a, there's a common theme and there's, there's even like little Easter eggs, little hints foreshadowing about what's to come. And what Luke is doing here is he's starting his gospel, this book, with the end in mind. First point today, start with the end in mind. Just imagine, imagine what it could look like. Imagine how much better our lives would be. Imagine how much less stress there would be if the city planners of Charleston thought the end in mind before they made 526 and 26. <laughs> like, could you imagine how much like just better would be if they like really thought about the ending when they made Ashley frustrate? Like, like <laughs> Starting with the end in mind is, 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 is it's important, and that's what Luke is doing here. But what if we did it actually just not only with city planning and highways, but in our own lives? What if we started each of our days with that day's end in mind? Like, what if I started and said, okay, how do I want my relationship with my wife to look like at the end of the day? What if I started with that and, and, and like, okay, what, what, what love do I want there to be? What care, like encouraging words do I want there to be? How do I want my relationship with my parents to be at the end of the day? Screaming and yelling? Like if you started your day off and thought, okay, this is how I want it to look like. Does it look like screaming and yelling and fighting or does it look like one of encouragement? Where do I want my relationship to God be at the end of this day? What if I started the day off with that? And here's the truth. There's power in how we start when we think about how we want it to end. It's truth. There's power when we start our day with the end in mind. And because Luke is writing this story, he's inspired by Holy Spirit. And so the details that matter, God is planning out the story. And by the way, God is like the greatest storyteller of all time. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, what it's going to be like when we get to heaven and we get to hear history from the mouth of God and like how everything just worked all together. Because that's, that's what his story is. It's just that, his story. History is, is just his story. And what's it going to be like? And so Luke is writing this, inspired by Holy Spirit. He's writing this out, and all the little things matter. And so we can't go through this whole book 
We can't pick out all the themes. I can't pick out all the little details. I can't preach that long. I'm not pastor. <laughs> pastor can, is able to do it. I, I can't do that. But I want to look at just a moment at how he starts by looking at how he ends. So how he starts, remember, verse 7 is, she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. And then at the end of this, chap of this book, Luke 24, this is after Jesus has died. He's died on the cross. His disciples are scattered. The man that they had been following for three years that they thought was gonna be the new king and save them from the Romans, the person that they like put their trust in, they, they've now seen die on a cross. He's been in the tomb for three days. And they're all defeated. And Mary and some other women go to the tomb and they see that it's empty. And an angel appears to them and says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He has risen. And look at verse nine, it says, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of jo James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to them. So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping down, he peered in and he saw empty linen wrappings. He went home again and wondered what had happened. Baby Jesus wrapped in linen cloth as a picture of what the end would look like. Because when Jesus died, they would have wrapped his body in linen wrappings. And what was left behind in the tomb? Those wrappings. It's a little Easter egg. It's a little, you know, Luke is giving this small detail because he's showing us that to God, remember, God, Holy Spirit is inspiring him. He's showing us that God has the end in mind. And if it's not good, then he's not done. If, he's, if it's not good, the situation that you're struggling with right now, and you're saying, this is the end. This is the end of the relationship. God's saying, it's not done. If this is the end of this year, and you're like saying the numbers don't matter, or the numbers don't add up, God is saying, hey, it's not done yet because I'm not done yet. Because y'all, in the total end, Jesus wins. It's like the devil is on borrowed time. He is not God's rival. No, like God, he is waiting on borrowed time right now because God is gonna come back and defeat the enemy once and for all. That's how it ends. That's the hope we have. That's the trust we have in Jesus. And that's good news. But those things, it, 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 those small things matter because see, God, he created time and space. He's outside of it. And so when Luke is writing that she's wrapped in linen cloth, he made sure to put that same word, that same wrapping at the end that was left behind in the tomb. But look, there's, it's so much more than just that. Look, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. So not only is he wrapped but he's laid in a manger. And I was talking to one of my students and we were talking about what I was gonna be preaching on and they reminded me something about, something I'd forgotten about. I learned this a long time ago, maybe it was in school. And most of us, when we think of manger, like you think of that nativity scene, or I have a picture of it here. This is, this is typically what we think, right? Because that's what you see at the live nativities. That's what you, you know, see in pictures, maybe even movies. That's, that's typically what we think of. But that's not what it would have been. I mean, that, the animals would have like chewed on it like because it was for their food. So like it would have been hard to clean. What it actually, this is, and this is so cool. Student remind me of this. What the manger actually would have looked like would have been something like this. Stone. So baby Jesus is wrapped and laid in Stone. One day, Jesus' body is wrapped and laid in a tomb. What is a tomb made out of? Stone. It's this perfect picture of God working out all things. It's this picture that he's got a plan. If you don't believe that God has a plan for your life, let this be an encouragement to you. He's got a plan for you. If he's planned this out, he's got a plan for each and every soul in this building. Unique. And these things matter. 
You might be thinking, oh, this is all cool and all, cool Bible knowledge, but why does this matter? You might be thinking, like, who cares? Okay, so God is able to make some details matter. But I, I believe that God has shown me this while preparing for this, studying for this. He's showing me that the small things matter. He, God is, like, I've been seeing that the small things matter. It might have just been a small thing for Mary and Joseph to see a baby wrapped and cloth lying in a stone manger, but it ties this whole story together. And I asked you earlier, imagine if you start your day with, with the ending in mind. Now, what if I, I started my day? Okay, this is how I want the relationship to end, to start my day. Now, what small things can I do to make that happen? What, what small way of act of service can I show my wife and say, okay, I want my, at the end of the day to look like this. So what small things, because the small things matter, the small things add up. And so what small thing can I, can I do? What act of service can I say to my wife? Can I do, well, what, what about this? What, what encouraging word can you say to your kids? If you start your day and you say, I want to have a better relationship with my kids, what encouraging word can I say to them to let them know that I support them? If I want to end the day closer with God, that was, that was one. That's one that we've, I mean, if you're here today and, and you don't know Jesus, I'm glad that you're here. But like, there's something that drew, drew you here. There's some, someone invited you here. And many of us here, we want a closer relationship with God. And so if we start our day saying, okay, I want to, I want to have the end in mind. I want to be closer with God. What small prayer. We talk about it all the time. The, the pause, the power in the pause of just 30 seconds, one minute, just taking a time, say, okay, this small prayer matters. God, I'm gonna pray to you. I'm just gonna breathe in your presence. If anything, like, just stop, close your eyes, and just, God, I love you. The small things matter, they really do. During this Christmas season, we talk a lot about inviting someone to church. We call them ID3, is to identify three people in our life that are close to us, but they're far from God, and we want to invite them to hear about the goodness of Jesus. And like Pastor Connie said earlier, this is the like one weekend a year. This in Easter is where people will just say yes with the invite. And they'll say yes, like, hey, I'll, I'll actually come. So the power we have in here. So what if I start my day with the end in mind and say, okay, I want to start by inviting this coworker to Christmas Eve experiences. So what small thing can I do? to make that happen, because it's again, the small thing matter. It seems small. That social media post that you put on your story, it seems small, it only, it's only up for 24 hours, it seems so small, but it means so much. Like you don't realize who's seeing it at what point, and God could be working out all these details perfectly, like we don't see that. Mary and Joseph didn't see how this detail of Jesus being wrapped, laid in stone, really mattered until later. It, it might seem small to invite someone with an invite card. I mean, we've, we've got enough of them. Take one or two. Shoot, take three or four. I mean, like, we, we've got them. And so use them. <laughs> There's one, one year. I took a lot. And it was Easter, and I was still finding Christmas invites in my car. <laughs> Ashley, our creative director, was like, where's our Easter cards going? I was like, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just taking them and going and giving it everywhere. Those, but they matter. They absolutely matter, and it seems small, like this image of baby Jesus. But it means so much to this Christmas story. It means so much to the story of Luke, but it also means so much to the story of what God is doing in the totality of time. I wanna show you about these wrappings. They're not just foreshadowing about what's to come, but it's also a call back, all the way back to Genesis. Because remember, the Christmas story, it's, it's almost like Inception. The Christmas story is, in the story, is, is a story within a story of Luke, within the story of the Bible, which is 66 different books, and it's all one story of how we were lost God loved us so much, and there's redemption. And in the beginning, in Genesis 3, there's the fall. Adam and Eve, you may not have heard of Adam and Eve. They, they ate the fruit, and they sinned, and our relationship with God was torn. This is why we need a baby Jesus. 
This is why we needed a savior is because we were in relationship with him. But then, you know, in the, in the eve, sin came and entered. And look what happens from the story. This is the callback. The first thing that Adam and Eve do when sin enters the story. The woman was convinced and she saw verse 6 in Genesis 3. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruits looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. And she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. The first thing they feel when sin enters the story is they feel shame. And what do they do when they feel that shame? They wrap themselves up with fig leaves. They wrap themselves. Verse 21 says, the Lord God made clothing from an animal skin for Adam and his wife. So they felt shame. They tried to wrap themselves and God said, you know what? No, that's not gonna work here. I've sacrificed an animal for you. First record of death in the Bible was used to cover their shame. And then thousands of years later, a baby is born wrapped in cloth, laid in stone, And it's a perfect picture of God working all things. But but here's the truth. Baby Jesus wasn't just wrapped in linen cloth. He's wrapped in our shame. He's wrapped in our hurt. He's wrapped in our pain. He's wrapped in our sin. He's wrapped in all that and lived a perfect life so that we could have the relationship with God again. God's been trying to get us back to the garden to say, hey, I want that relationship with you again. And someone needs to hear this today. Let go of the shame you're wrapped in. Let go of the shame that has you so tightly wrapped. Did you notice that Adam and Eve, when they felt that shame, they tried to wrap themselves up with something? Like they wrap themselves up and it might not be shame for you. Maybe for you, it's fear. Like you've got yourself so wrapped up in fear because you're so worried about, so constantly thinking about tomorrow, what tomorrow holds. Tomorrow's not even promised. And yet we're so constantly worried and we wrap ourselves in fear. We, we let our minds get ahead of us. What does Paul say is that we should capture those thoughts and not let them spiral. But maybe for you, it's, you're, you're wrapped up in unforgiveness. And someone hurt you, and they, hey, that hurt was real. That pain was real. Don't let anyone say that pain wasn't real. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you, you let them back into your space, but you do give them grace. And some of us are so wrapped up in unforgiveness. Some of us are so wrapped up in guilt. Man, I can't believe I, I did that again. I can't believe I picked up that bottle of pills or bottle of alcohol. or the, I can't believe I went to that website again. I can't believe, like, there, there, some of us are wrapped up in an addiction, and we're wrapped, we wrap ourselves in it because like, even though it is an addiction, there's like a comfort to it because we've been wrapped up for so long and we, we'd rather stay wrapped up and we'd rather wrap up ourselves than let God do what God can do. We've all done it, wrapped ourselves up in comfort. And I wanna remind you of the title of my sermon is what are you wrapped in? What have you been wrapping yourself up in? See, Adam and Eve, they felt shame. They wrapped themselves up in leaves. And God comes in and says, those leaves aren't gonna work. I've got a sacrifice for you. I've got something for you so you don't need to feel that shame anymore. Psalm 119, 114 says, you're my place of quiet retreat. Your wraparound presence becomes my shield. I love that word, shield. To protect of whatever the enemy, whatever the lies of the enemy that he's throwing at you. His wraparound presence is your shield. Is my shield as I wrap myself in your word. I wanna show you how I've seen this in my, my own life. I recently picked up a side hustle. Um, I've been working a dog and duck across the street and I've never been a server before and um, I don't know why because I love people and so I was like, this is gonna be fun and I, I'm really enjoying it and I'm getting, like, getting really good at it and it's super fun and I, and I do love being on staff at a church but here's the thing, being on staff at a church, like, I sometimes forget like, what it's like outside of these walls. Like, I, can I just be honest with you guys? Like, I've, I, I've forgotten a little bit because here's the thing, everyone I work with 
Even though we might, you know, get on each other a little bit, we might, you know, get frustrated. Ashley might be like, stop taking all my invite cards. <laughs> but we all love Jesus. Like everyone that works here, I can, I can say with, with like 100%, everyone here on staff loves Jesus. We all do. And we're all on mission together. We all have like the same um, vision. We're, we're fighting after the same thing to help people far from God, but close to us, find freedom in Christ. And I've forgotten what it's like outside of that wall, outside of these walls. Uh, not, not 99% of you here today, you work in a place where that's not the case. That's not the case. And so I told myself that when I started, I, I, I started this job with the end in mind. Like I literally start like, okay, I'm going to do a little side hustle, but also like I love people and I'm, I'm just going to be a light. Like I told myself what I tell my students all the time is like, hey, be a light in your dark places because the, man, those the schools that they're, they're in right now, Man, there's some dark places in their hallway. Some of the families they're, they're in right now, some dark places. And so I'm like, okay, you know what? Be a light. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what I preach. And, that's, and so I started my day with the end in mind. I thought to myself, what small things can I do while I'm, I'm working there to like just, you know, be a light? And I remember talking to one guy and he, he asked me, he's like, man, you, I love your energy. Uh, what, the exact words he used was like, man, you, your energy is so cool. I love the vibe. Like, where's it come from? And it, it was like this moment where I was like, I mean, man, I, I just love Jesus. Like, I, I was down a dark path and Jesus saved me. And so you are probably, like I said, 99% of you, you're working in a place where people don't know Jesus. How amazing that you are working around people who don't know Jesus. How incredible that you get to be that light. So when you need the encouragement, maybe you can, you can do that small thing. It's like, next time I need encouragement, I'm gonna be that encouraging word for a coworker. Maybe you can be the light and decide, okay, I am not gonna jump into the gossip like everyone else. I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit different. I, I can decide, you know what? I'm, not, I'm gonna give grace and I'm gonna look out for the team, even though everyone else is looking out for number one. Like you have that opportunity because you're around people who don't love Jesus and you can be that light. And so I remember going into work at the, there and um, I was just being my happy-go-lucky self and I was just like, choo choose and joy. I don't know if you've heard, but sometimes people on Food and Bev, like there's a certain stigma that they're grumpy and the people there are great, but like some people were like, looking like the Grinch, they're like, mm. I was like, just choose and joy. And so we started talking and, and one of the um, coworkers, she asked me like, oh, what else do you do? You do this full time? I was like, no, I'm actually, I work across the street. I work at the church. And, and immediately she goes, oh, I need to get back into church. Which, by the way, anytime I tell someone like what I do for a living, like if I'm just out and about, like their immediate response is like, oh yeah, I need to get back into church. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, bro. Like you don't need to prove it to me. And like, and, and it was this moment where we were starting to talk and she's like, yeah, I really need to get back in. My kids would get a lot out of it, but I haven't been in so long. And I saw it. Y'all have been preparing for the sermon for a minute now, and, but I hadn't had like this personal connection yet. I didn't know, like I hadn't seen it yet in my own life and God showed it to me. I saw it. She felt shame for not coming to church, which kept her from coming to church, which she then felt, and then it's just a cycle. And she was, I could see it in her. And she, she was caught in this cycle. And there are people that you work with that are caught in that very same cycle. But guess what? At this church, we don't judge you if you ain't been here in a while. That's okay. What do we say? No perfect people allowed up in here. Like, it's okay. And you have, you have the ability, the opportunity to release that coworker from shame and be like, hey, I know you haven't been to church in a while. That's okay. We ain't going to judge you. In fact, we crazy as well. Like, it's all good. You have that ability to release that person from the shame that they've been trapped in the cycle in for so long. And if you're here today, like, you don't have that shame because you're here, obviously, right? Like, like, oh, I ain't got no shame for not being at church. I'm here. In fact, you're here the week before Christmas Eve. Y'all are like real deal. And it's raining. Come on, somebody. Give yourselves a hand. Y'all are credible. Like, you are like the foot soldiers. Like, you are the core church. Let's go. And if you don't love Jesus here, find a prayer member at the end, and they'll tell you exactly what you need to do. But most of us here, we probably, 
You know, we're not feeling that shame. You know, we're, we're here today. But I wonder, oh, Holy Spirit, help me with this. I wonder how many of us feel shame for the things that we've done in the past. Maybe even things that we did yesterday. And we think, I could never be that person that invites someone. I wonder if there's someone here that's so full of shame, so wrapped up in fear, so wrapped up in guilt, that you think, I can never be that person that invites someone. Maybe for you it's, I can't invite my kid to, to Christmas Eve. We just got into a huge fight. What are they gonna think of me? Maybe you think, oh, I, I can't invite that coworker. I, I just sent that very passive aggressive email and they saw it, the whole company did. I can't, I'll look like a hypocrite and you feel like shame. Maybe I can't invite my neighbor. Like they saw that party I threw the other week. Like I can't invite, what are they gonna think of me? I can't invite my relatives. Like I know that the church hurt they have. What if they lash out at me? You think I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't do this. And we, and we do exactly what Adam and Eve do is we wrap ourselves up and you know what? I can't do it anymore. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus is you're right. I can't, but Jesus can. Jesus in me can. Here's the thing. It, I, can, I can feel like Adam and Eve and I'm wrapping myself up, but he's worked out this beautiful story together. And let me show you one more detail as we wrap up. Remember the shepherds week one, Pastor Andy talked about how we don't know exactly who the shepherds were. Like they could have been temple priests. They could have, we don't really know. But one of the things we do know, Luke 2, 12, it says that it would be a sign to them. Luke 2, 12, it says, you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and laying in a manger. See, I got this article about the traditions of Jewish culture about the shepherds that Pastor Andy talked about and says that there is a tradition that the shepherds who in the hillside were not too far from Jerusalem provided the lambs without blemish. They would provide the, the, the sacrificial lamb for the Passover. And the first newborn lamb to protect it, to keep it safe from any blemish as it was required by law, it was wrapped in swaddling cloth and place in a food trough apart from the other sheep. And so they would find the Savior, Christ Jesus, wrapped just like they wrapped their own precious lambs after its birth. See, Jesus was the final sacrificial lamb without blemish, blemish wrapped in our sins, laid in stones so that we could find freedom. And if you've allowed Jesus to save you, if you've allowed Jesus to save you, the same spirit that rose Jesus from that grave, the same spirit that left those wrappings in that tomb, in that stone tomb, lives in us. And the beautiful thing is with Jesus, we can say goodbye fear, goodbye guilt, goodbye shame. Maybe during response, you wanna go to the crosses, there's crosses on the side, and I love when y'all do that, and I'll see our students do it, and I'll just read and pray over it. And maybe you just wanna write, like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna invite that person. I, am, I don't have shame for it anymore. I don't have any shame about Jesus anymore. Maybe you wanna go to a candle and, and light that candle as a symbol. It's, it's nothing magical, it's just a symbol, an action step we can take to say, you know what, I'm praying for that person. That ID3, say their name and pray for them. We can gather and we can take communion. The shame wrapping you up doesn't need to anymore because Jesus already took that wrapping for you and he left it in the tomb. There is no amount of shame that can keep you from Jesus. But listen, there's no amount of shame that can keep you from telling others about Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would work this message in our heart, God, that you would seal it and we would go out inspired, ready, full of your spirit because we say goodbye fear. We say goodbye guilt. We say goodbye shame and we will follow you, Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. And in your precious, perfect lamb son, we pray in his name, amen.